some things has to stop do you know that the sea level is gradually increasing in manhattan new york and can you believe the reason behind this is global warming yes the sea level rise is occurring all around the world due to global warming and increased surface temperature the ice which melts in antarctica and greenland region is mixed to the sea water and it increases the sea level Rising seas are sinking futures. Sea level rise is not only a threat in itself, it is a threat multiplier. New research and warnings about the risk of worsening flooding connected with climate change. A report released today by the research organization Climate Central finds the rise in sea level along many coastal communities is accelerating. Climate change is going to change every aspect of our lives. And if we look at something like sea level rise, it uh is an impact that is does not have to be far away from home it is an impact that we can see on our streets it's we can see it in our basements um and we need to have an understanding of how we can adapt mitigate and build resiliency to future uh, extreme weather events um to reduce the problem of sea level rise My name is JD Allen. I am a lecturer in the School of Communication and Journalism at Stony Brook University in New York, um where I teach uh, solutions journalism and climate communications. Um I consider myself a science communicator. I'm a nationally award-winning um science podcaster uh for my work with Higher Ground from WSAQ Public Radio. Every year the sea level in manhattan is increasing in inches in 2050 it is expected to be increased up to a foot on the end of this century the sea level will be increased up to meters high manhattan is the busiest costliest richest heaviest and the largest city in the united states with tall skyscrapers famous parks iconic bridges and best transportations which carries millions of people in a day this concrete jungle weighs approximately 3 billion tons and above manhattan carries a lot of weight on its surface which makes it as a heaviest city when compared to other cities sea level rise has been a slowly encroaching reality for new yorkers and um we have experienced impacts of climate change like sea level rise generationally throughout our lifetimes coastal communities have gotten pretty wise to rising sea levels um even if we didn't put our thumb on it as impacts of climate change but we have uh begun to harden our harbors we've begun to raise structures out of flood zones the problem is is that the momentum is not fast enough And so when we do have extreme weather um in conjunction with rising tides we do have vulnerable areas and vulnerable communities where we do see intense flooding due to uh failures of uh stormwater uh and wastewater systems that do not carry excess water back out into our waterways and if our waterways are closer to our the tops of our harbors then that water can just filter right back um into uh vulnerable communities. So it really is a, a kind of a double-sided problem um where we have a aged infrastructure uh but we also have a uh a more persistent and extreme threat to um uh weather conditions that can uh put a stress on the infrastructure that we have. Heavy rains, hurricanes, thunderstorms very often cause flood in the city of new york so we've had named and unnamed storms over the past uh several years um like tropical storm asaias and then just your run of the mill august storm um that has created um more s- dangerous situations for new yorkers in the last 5 years new york have been flooded several times on 2012 october 29 hurricane sandy affected new york especially new york city Due to Hurricane Sandy, New York City's subway system were flooded heavily. Difficult to imagine what lies beneath in stations just like this one all over Lower Manhattan. What you're about to see is a collection of everything that Sandy brought to bear, and water 
is the least of it. We have seen failed um, infrastructure problems. So we're not talking about directly on the water, but we're talking about um, potentially blocks or miles away from the shore where we have excess water that um, is uh, uh, not being removed uh, due to problems with stormwater systems uh, that are flooding um, subway systems, uh, that are flooding um, uh, basement apartments. And um, it has caused some loss of life and definitely um, hundreds of thousands of dollars and millions of dollars in damage. Um, and so the question is, is how do we build back and can we build back equitably? And so my role as a, a climate journalist is to really follow how communities build resilience uh, to future storms, as well as uh, how do we mitigate, so reduce the damage, as well as um, adapt, meaning get out of the way of uh, future damage. Uh, so that way we can continue to be coastal people. I mean, it doesn't matter whether or not you live right on the water or if you live uh, in Central Park. New Yorkers are coastal people. And so if we want to continue to live here, we need to um, have the information that we need to make better informed decisions uh, about uh, about local climate impacts. And that's where my job really comes in is so that people are informed. As the seawater increases, in the New York, it also increases by oceanic region. It also faces floods from the Hudson River. The Hudson River flows south through the Hudson Valley to the New York Harbor, flows between New York City and the Jersey City, and then mixes into the Atlantic Ocean at Upper New York Bay. These coastal regions are highly vulnerable and flood-prone zones. How can this highly vulnerable and flood-prone zones in New York's Manhattan can be protected? What I've seen from different models that have come out um, is that uh, newer models are showing more vulnerability in our coastline. Um, it, uh, it really depends on the model that you're looking at, uh, but areas where there um, are the most uh, infrastructure failures or the oldest infrastructure, um, and especially in communities of uh, color um, that do not have the type of representation, um, or the financial ability to uh, rebuild it every time there is a, a problem are where the flood zones uh, continue to be the, of the most threat. Um, so uh, in order for us to keep our neighbors, we all need to uh, look around at um, who is in the, in the flood zone. Um, one strategy that is being used that um, is doing a good job of keeping uh, communities out of uh, out of flood zones is to say, for instance, build taller. And so through my reporting, what we have found is that um, obviously that is an expensive uh, that is an expensive ask and usually on the uh, backs of the homeowners or of, of the bill, the property owners. And so it means that um, maybe uh, Families who have been there generationally or um, low income or communities of color that I said do not have the financial ability to stay um, have the difficult question of if they cannot build out of the way the flood zone, where do they go? And so are we losing New Yorkers um, to climate uh, impacts? So on a day to day basis, New Yorkers might not find any real change in their daily life. Um, if we look over time. Um, over years, over decades, um, we can certainly see a change uh, where there might be properties that were once right up on the coast that have now uh, moved away, or there might be destroyed properties that were uh, near the coast um, that, that have been um, taken on by the municipality and designated as a conservation space and allow for vegetation to uh, grow back. Um, and that allows a natural barrier between the rising seawaters and um, endangered properties. Uh, as water floods, it gets deterred by natural uh, vegetation, a natural barrier. I think that both natural and hard structures, from what I've seen from and observed from my reporting, both have timelines to them. Um, they're both not long-term solutions, right? Long-term solutions really involved um, conversations about how do we potentially move away from co the coast and surrender um, to rising tides. I mean, 
water water will win. It's just about when and can we be safe when it happens. And this is not going to happen overnight. It's going to happen over decades of us having the conversation of um, do we need a managed retreat in order to um, in order to continue to live here. Um, it doesn't mean that we all need to uh, sell our properties and move away from the coast. But when we talk about hundreds of years here, our our coastline is going to look a lot different than it is today. When we start to implement hard structures. Raising of roads, more solid um, uh, flood walls. What we are doing is that we're limiting the water from being able to come here now. When we start to put down um, um, like those stones and other hard barriers on coastlines, um, it is for a time protective. Um, but extreme weather, which uh, and rising sea level, which will take sand away from um, this area from erosion. Um, now is coming up against a hard structure, and so the water, if it can't go over, it's going to go around. And when water goes around, it means that the island of Fire Island might be a string of pearls in 50 years. Um, if you go 150 years or 500 years, it might mean Long Island could be a string of pearls if we continue to put hardscapes that prevent water from moving through in a safe way. The longest term solution, I don't think we're there yet. Um, I think the long term plan right now, if there is one, is that we need to make really large strides in reducing our impact um, and our contribution uh, to climate change. I think that state and federal governments are like never before putting money on the table, which is a which is a good positive thing. Um, there are considerations, there are bills on the table that would put more responsibility to um, corporations, um, especially if they are involved in the contribution to climate change. So we hear about carbon tax, we hear about the Climate Superfund Act in New York that shift the responsibility of who is going to pay the states, so that way they continue to have money to be able to offer to municipalities and homeowners and business owners um, to continue to to become more resilient and mitigate um, climate impacts. Um, the longest term solution, I don't think we're there yet. Um, I think the long term plan right now, if there is one, is that we need to make really large strides in reducing our impact um, and our contribution uh, to climate change. Um, our warming planet is going to happen. Um, there is uh, a lot of community and grassroots efforts, as well as really important regional and national and international um, lobbying and advocacy groups that are um, calling attention to very large global uh, and national um, uh, policy changes to reduce our global impact. Um, and we all need to make some kind of stride against climate change, whether it is our biggest decision makers or how what you decide to do at the gas pump. You know, we need to all have this kind of climate consciousness. And my job as a climate communicator and as a science journalist is to make sure that my community understands what local impacts of climate change are and do they have the information and can I provide them the information so that way they can make the best informed, best informed decision um, for their pocketbook, for their families, for their communities going forward. Um, climate change is going to change every aspect of our lives, full stop. The more that we can understand local climate impacts, the more we can understand our global responsibility in the face of climate change. Um, rising sea level is a factor in that. And for a coastal community like ours, it should be top of mind. For future generation, there is no other choice. I'm Kishore Kumar, reporting from New York. Thank you.